looking at To Kill a Mockingbird and looking at chapter 15 today. Now, um, this is in part two of the story where um, the time of the trial of Tom Robinson is drawing near. Um, and it's worth saying that in this time in the 1930s in America, in the South, there was still unfortunately something called a lynch mob that would often occur. Now, a lynch mob would be a gang of um, people getting together to exercise their own mob justice so if somebody was um due to be held on trial for an offense um the lynch mob basically would take them and just publicly uh, hang them um without them going through a proper trial um so obviously this was this was illegal um but unfortunately, it often happened in cases particularly where black men were involved. So you'd get a, a gang of white men uh, forming a lynch mob, getting the black man and hanging him publicly like on a tree in the middle of the town before he'd even got to trial, um, before he'd been even been given a, a verdict by a judge or anything else. Um, now, that would often happen with crimes such as rape. And in this case of Tom Robinson, he is on trial for um, being accused of raping Mayella Ewell. So Atticus is really aware that there is this danger that some people may try and take justice into their own hands, even if they don't know the case, even if they don't know the ins and outs, they haven't even heard it in court. Um, and so the, in chapter 15, the first thing that happens is that Heck Tate, um, who is the kind of um, county sheriff, um, he comes to visit um, just to say they're moving Tom Robinson to the county jail tomorrow and he's worried there's going to be trouble. In other words, there may be a lynch mob who might um, turn up and demand Tom Robinson for themselves. Now, um, at this point, Jem and Scout don't really understand too much of what's happening. Um, Scout knows that in Maycomb, grown men stood outside in the front yard for only two reasons, death death and politics so she knows that that something's going to be up um, and she also overhears uh link d's warning atticus you've got everything to lose from this atticus i mean everything but atticus stands firm on his conviction link that boy might go to the chair but he's not going till the truth's told atticus's voice was even and you know what the truth is even if Tom Robinson is condemned and condemned to go to the electric chair as a sentence, if he's, he's, if he's sentenced to capital punishment, Atticus wants the trial to happen and he wants the truth to be told. Now, um, Jem is still got this feeling that something is up. Um, and even though Atticus tries to reassure Jem that um, things like uh, mobs, and gangs don't happen in Maycomb. Um, he even says about the Ku Klux being gone and never coming back, which again is kind of ironic given that you've got a bunch of white people against a black man who is innocent. Um, but basically they see that um, Atticus uh, the next day takes the car to the Maycomb jail, which is obviously where Tom Robinson is being moved in preparation for his trial. Jem just has this feeling that something's going to happen and so Jem and Scout um, go to sort of watch from a distance at the Maycomb jail and they can see their father sitting outside the jail um, with an electric light and a newspaper but then they see a bunch of men pulling up in their cars um, and getting out um, he in there Mr Finch a man said he is we heard Atticus answer and he's asleep don't wake him up you know what we want, another man said. Get aside from the door, Mr Finch. You can turn around and go home again, Walter, Atticus said pleasantly. Heck, Tate's around somewhere. So, this bunch of guys has turned up as a lynch mob to get Tom Robinson out of the jail. And Atticus sits on his own outside the jail to um, ward them off, basically. Now, the men start to be quite threatening. Um, they say that they've distracted Heck, uh, Heck Tate and his bunch of guys in the woods um, on a snipe hunt. Um, and Scout and Jem see the situation and begin to twig that their father is in danger. Um, and so Scout runs up to her father 
and bursts through the circle um, into the um, into the middle of these strangers. Um, there was a smell of stale whiskey and pig pen about. When I glanced around, I discovered these men were strangers. They were not the people I saw last night. Hot embarrassment shot through me. I had leaped triumphantly into a ring of people I had never seen before. Go home, Jem, Atticus said. Take Scout and Dill home. We were accustomed to prompt, if not always cheerful acquiescence to Atticus's instructions, but from the way he stood, Jem was not thinking of budging. Go home, I said. Jem shook his head. As Atticus's fists went to his hips, so did Jem's, and as they faced each other, I could see little resemblance between them. Mutual defiance made them alike. Now, this is the point where Jem really becomes a man, because at this point, he thinks, no, I'm not a kid anymore. You're not going to just send me and scout home. I can see you're in trouble, and I'm not going to leave you here. And so even though Attica says, you know, go home, take Scout and Dill home, Jem twigs that something serious is going on, even though he doesn't actually know quite what, um, and refuses to go anywhere. Son, I said go home. Jem shook his head. I'll send him home, a burly man said, and grabbed Jem roughly by the collar. He yanked Jem nearly off his feet. Don't you touch him. I kicked the man swiftly. Barefooted, I was surprised to see him fall back in real pain. I intended to kick his shin, but aimed too high. That'll do, Scout. Atticus put his hand on my shoulder. Don't kick, folks. No, he said, as I was pleading justification. Ain't nobody going to do Jem that way, I said. Now, even in this situation, when there's basically a, a lynch mob present and their own lives are at risk, Attica still reinforces his message to Scout that you don't retaliate violence for violence. Um, you don't you don't kick people. And it kind of feels a bit of an ironic message. You know, don't kick folks when here's these guys wait, waiting to take out Tom Robinson and string him up on a tree somewhere. But in another sense, it shows Attica staying calm and collected and trying to defuse the tension in the situation rather than escalate it, which is what confrontation would have done. All right, Mr Finch, get him out of here, someone growled. You've got 15 seconds to get him out of here. In the midst of this strange assembly, Attica stood trying to make Jem mind him. I ain't going, was his steady answer to Atticus's threats, requests and finally, please Jem, take them home. I was getting a bit tired of that, but felt Jem had his own reasons for doing as he did, in view of his prospects once Atticus did get home. I looked round the crowd. It was a summer's night, but the men were dressed, most of them in overalls and denim shirts buttoned up to the collars. I thought they must be cold-natured as their sleeves were unrolled and buttoned at the cuffs. Some wore hats pulled firmly down over their ears. They were southern-looking, sleepy-eyed men who seemed unused to late hours. I sought once more for a familiar face, at the centre of the semicircle, I found one. Hey, Mr Cunningham! The man didn't hear me, it seemed. Hey, Mr Cunningham, how's your entailment getting along? Mr Walter Cunningham's legal affairs were well known to me. Atticus had once described them at length. The big man blinked and hooked his thumbs in his overall straps. He seemed uncomfortable. He cleared his throat and looked away. My friendly overture had fallen flat. Mr Cunningham wore no hat. The top half of his forehead was white in contrast to his sun-scorched face. Don't you remember me, Mr Cunningham? I'm Jean Louise Finch. You brought us some hickory nuts one time, remember? I began to sense the futility one feels when unacknowledged by a chance acquaintance. I go to school with Walter, I began again. He's your boy, ain't he? Ain't he, sir? Mr Cunningham was moved to a faint nod. He did know me after all. He's in my grade, I said, and he does right well. He's a good boy, I added, a real nice boy. We brought him home for dinner one time. Maybe he told you about me. I beat him up one time, but he was real nice about it. Tell him hey for me, won't you? Atticus had said it was the polite thing to talk to people about what they were interested in, not about what you were interested in. Mr Cunningham displayed no interest in his son, so I tackled his entailment once more in a last-ditch effort to make him feel at home. Entailments are bad. I was advising him when I slowly awoke to the fact I was in, a, addressing the entire aggregation. The men were all looking at me. Some had their mouths half open. Atticus had stopped poking at Jem. They were standing together beside Dill. Their attention amounted to fascination. Atticus's mouth even was half open, an attitude he had once described as uncouth. Our eyes met and he shut it. 
Well, Atticus, I was just saying to Mr Cunningham that entailments are bad and all that, but you said not to worry. It takes a long time sometimes, and you'd all ride it out together. I was slowly drying up, wondering what idiocy I'd committed. Entailments seemed all right enough for living room talk. I began to feel sweat gathering at the edges of my hair. I could stand anything but a bunch of people looking at me. They were quite still. What's the matter? I asked. Atticus said nothing. I looked around and up at Mr Cunningham, whose face was equally impassive. Then he did a peculiar thing. He squatted down and took me by both shoulders. I'll tell him you said hey, little lady, he said. Then he straightened up and waved a big paw. Let's clear out, he called. Let's get going, boys. Now, what's hilarious in this situation is that Scout, desperately wanting to put into practice Atticus's lessons of, you know, making feel com people feel comfortable, talk to them at their language, at their level. She tries all these different ways of engaging Walter Cunningham's father in conversation. And in doing so, she reminds him, uncomfortably in this situation, because he's there to lynch John Robinson, she reminds him of uh, the fact that this is a person too. You know, here's Atticus Finch um, just doing his job as a lawyer defending Tom Robinson. Um, he is his daughter. And suddenly it makes Walter Cunningham realise, I can't lynch this guy now. I can't in front of his daughter and his son. Um, and so Scout, without knowing what she's doing, completely diffuses the tension um, and actually saves them all because um, then he calls all the, the guys away. Um, and then it, we discover then Mr Underwood and a double barrel shotgun were leaning out above the Maycomb Tribune office and um, Tom was, was awake all the time, listening in, terrified that something was going to happen to him. We see what may have happened here. Had the lynch mob tried to attack Atticus, perhaps Mr Underwood would have shot them, perhaps there would have been violence, perhaps many people would have died, we don't know. But what we do know is that crisis has been narrowly averted here uh, and Scout's kind of the hero of the moment but without really understanding what she's even done. Later, when Atticus talks to them about it, um, he says, Mr Cunningham is basically a good man. He just has his blind spots along with the rest of us. Jem spoke. Don't call that a blind spot. He'd have killed you last night when you first went there. Atticus says, a mob's always made up of people, no matter what. You children last night made Walter Cunningham stand in my shoes for a minute. That was enough. When Scout whispers that she may um, beat Walter up again, Atticus says, you will not touch him. I don't want either of you bearing a grudge about this thing, no matter what happens. So again, Atticus is reinforcing his central message of empathy, of making sure you put yourself in someone else's shoes and you don't retaliate in kind, but you be the bigger person. You don't bear a grudge. Um, you move on and, and you patiently wait for change. Hit subscribe if you'd like to follow my vlog for more updates on teaching, reading and studying.